All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on the newly released What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide on Preparing Young Children for School. This is the last of three webinars on this practice guide. This webinar will focus on recommendations five, six, and seven on vocabulary, letters and sounds, and shared book reading. This webinar is being recorded. A link to view the recorded webinar will be shared via email to all attendees who registered for this webinar. The full practice guide and supporting materials, including this recording, will also be available on the IES website. The views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the expert panelists and do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of the WWC. Resources shared during this webinar are not necessarily WWC products nor developed from IES funded work. We will have time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them in the Q&A box and we will address them towards the end of the webinar. Practice guides are products developed by the What Works Clearinghouse or WWC. Practice guides provide educators with evidence-based practices to tackle current challenges in education. They combine the best available evidence and expertise on a topic to give educators strategies to use in their classrooms and schools. This practice guide on preparing young children for school is intended for educators in preschool classrooms, those supervising teachers and overseeing educational practices for preschool programs, program directors and coordinators, district and state personnel, and parents and caregivers seeking to help children. This slide lists the 11 panel members who collaborated to develop this practice guide. Our presenters today include our panel chair, Peg Birchinal from the University of Virginia, Jorge Gonzalez from the University of Houston, Jill Pentamonti from the University of Notre Dame, and Elizabeth Schlesinger Devlin from Purdue University. We'll start this webinar with a brief overview of the evidence levels for the two recommendations, followed by an introduction to the overarching themes in the practice guide. Then our presenters will discuss recommendation five on vocabulary, recommendation six on letters and sounds, and recommendation seven on shared book reading, including the corresponding how-to steps. Each recommendation is assigned a level of evidence that indicates the strength of the evidence for the effect of the recommended practices on student achievement. The level of evidence is based on the number of studies supporting the recommended practices, whether the recommended practices were directly tested in the studies or tested in combination with other practices, whether the recommended practices consistently led to improved outcomes within and across studies, and whether the studies capture a diverse range of students and contexts. Recommendations five, six, and seven each have a strong level of evidence. I will now pass it on to Peg Bershinal, the panel chair. Peg? Thank you. Um, I'm Peg Bershinal and at the, from the University of Virginia. And as the panel chair, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I'd, I'd like to start by thanking IES for recognizing the need for an evidence-based practice guide for preschool and making it happen. I'd like to thank IRG for graciously and effectively shepherding the process. And I'd really like to thank all of the panelists for sharing their expertise. Um, as we talked about evidence-based practices that promote learning in preschoolers in social emotional learning, executive functioning, mathematics, literacy, and language, there were five themes that came up representing evidence-based practices that are fundamental to learning skills in all of these content areas. The first of those themes is the importance of scheduling time for intentional learning. Children learn best when instruction is intentional. Ideally, you develop lesson plans, if possible, using evidence-based curricula that articulate what, how, and where lessons are going to provide instruction. Um, and in terms of the what and how, it's important to plan what is taught. It's important to pace the, the presentations of the lessons from easy to more difficult, to be deliberate, to plan how you will introduce new skills. Perhaps you can embed questions or activities in those lessons that will allow the children to actively learn. 
to stay engaged and will allow you to check whether the children are understanding and learning the lessons you're hoping that you're teaching. Um, it is also important to engage to ensure that children have lots of active opportunities to practice new skills. In terms of where, we recommend a combination of skills. It's, it's really good to use whole group and small group instruction to int introduce new skills, ideally limiting whole group to about 10 minutes per session. We also recommend that you use center and individual activities to give children hands-on opportunities to practice. And it's during these hands-on opportunities that learning really occurs. On the second overarching theme involved the importance of interaction and conversation. We all learn best when we're interacting and talking with other people about what we're learning. This is important for each of us, but it's really important for preschoolers. They learn best when they not only hear what is being taught, but talk about what they're learning with teachers and peers. Ideally, this involves a conversation with a teacher and an individual child with at least three turns. For example, the child talks, the teacher talks, that child talks, and the teacher talks. That would be a four-turn conversation. And this can happen in whole group instruction, but probably works best in small group centers or in individual interactions between the child and that teacher. The third um, theme that emerged across all the content areas is the importance of lessons building sequentially. New learning should proceed in a deliberate and systematic order from easy to more difficult. It's in the fall, it's important to figure out what skills children have and start the lessons at that level to introduce new skills, showing how they build off of the skills that children have already acquired. And it's really important to provide lots of hands-on practice, both of these new skills that children are learning and of the skills they've already learned so that they can maintain those lessons. Next slide, please. The fourth theme involved the importance of scheduling time for intentional learning. Develop a schedule in which intentional instruction time is devoted to social emotional learning, executive functioning, mathematics, and literacy. Ensure that you provide instruction specific to each content area, while if possible, using instruction in one content area to repeat or reinforce lessons in another. So for example, while reading a book in which a child gets frustrated, perhaps you can ask what the child could do to calm down and hopefully evoke some of the SEL lessons that were taught earlier. The final and perhaps most important theme is the importance of recognizing everyone's background and experiences. Preschool should reflect and value the cultural, racial, and ling linguistic backgrounds of the children, teachers, and communities. The classroom should include artwork, books, activities, and conversations that reflect who the children are and celebrate their background. Next slide, please. Hello, I'm Jorge Gonzalez, and I'm from the University of Houston. And I will be discussing recommendation number five, intentionally plan activities to build children's vocabulary and language. Next slide, please. Vocabulary is one of the best predictors of reading comprehension. Correlations between vocabulary and reading comprehension are substantial. And it is under that information that I will discuss Recommendation five, intentionally planning activities to build children's vocabulary and language. Under this recommendation, there are four steps that, we will, that I will be discussing. Step one, choose three to five unique words to focus on each week and include review of these words in other weeks. How to step number two, introduce the words and their meaning. Step number three, Choose activities and materials that will offer children opportunities to practice using the target words. And step number four, engage in interactive conversations with children to reinforce and solidify understanding of vocabulary words. Next slide. How to step number one. Choose three to five unique words to focus on each week and include review of those words in other weeks. Identify words useful to know because they occur frequently and are depicted in books 
occur in conversations or other academic context. Choose a group of words that relate to a topic or theme or belong in a category of interest to children, such as where people, where people live and work, where animals live, what water does. Gradually add abstract language that is harder to depict, including abstract nouns and verbs. Prepositions, glue words used in school that are not easy to visualize. In thinking about words, think about words that are high utility to mature language users. Think of words that children are not likely to use independently and words that are important in comprehension. Next slide. So what are glue words? Glue words also refer, excuse me, referred to as high frequency words are some of the most common and essential words in the English language. They are the foundation of academic language and are often difficult to depict in pictures. When children don't know the meaning of glue words, sentences can be difficult to understand. Some common glue words include in, on, the, was, for, that, and so on. Next slide. How to step number two, introduce the words and their meanings. Spend time intentionally discussing the word and its meaning using child-friendly definitions. If using a book to introduce words, point to the relevant picture in the book and present a simple definition of the word. If planning in advance using a book, perhaps identify one or two words and then spend time on those words when you reach the appropriate page in the, in the children's book. In later readings or activities, pause to engage children in a conversation about the word and provide additional practice with the word. As children, ask children to share something related to the word or think about when they experience the word using various question types. When they experience the word is an example of priming background knowledge, bringing what children already know about the word and the concepts surrounding that word. Next slide. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Schlesinger Devlin from Purdue University. And I get the opportunity to share the practice pictures, examples, if you would, of how this translates into the classroom setting. Teachers teach a word and gradually ask children to do more with the word. This photo that you see before you is in our dramatic play. They happen to do construction and be able to focus on those key words to help reinforce the vocabulary that they're talking about in the stories. What's nice about this is it's also on Velcro. And so children can take not just the word, but the picture, walk around the room to it, maybe go over to the writing center, write a book about um, how you would use a saw or what you would do with a hammer. It's also really useful to have these key words being connected with visuals for our English language learners who might need that visual to help understand what that language word looks like. Next slide. How to step number three, choose activities and materials that will offer children opportunities to practice using the target vocabulary words. Children need multiple opportunities to think about and practice the words they are learning. We are talking about repeated review. Set up opportunities for the words to come up in children's play and consider Consider leading children in acting out the word, possibly using figurines, puppets, or other props. Next slide. Choose activities and materials that will offer children opportunity to practice using their target vocabulary. As, as children interact with the activities and materials, look for ways to incorporate conversation about the target vocabulary. When possible, extend the conversation about vocabulary words by asking children follow-up questions. Consider using inferential level questions. These questions ask children to infer the intent of a character in a book, predictions, associations, cause, or events. Next slide. So what a great way to incorporate those new words by actually 
acting them out. Here's a perfect example of a child acting out the word emerge by emerging from a tunnel. We get to talk about those samples that Jorge was talking, the prompts, if you would, being able to incorporate them in the classroom, being able to reenact stories, using puppets to retell those stories that focus on those specific terms and help with language development. And again, because you're acting out those focus words, those are great tools for our English language learners to connect the action with the words that they're learning. Next slide. How to step number four, engage in interactive conversations with children to reinforce or solidify understanding of vocabulary words. Look for ways throughout the day to reintroduce the tar target vocabulary words into conversations or discussions with children to provide additional opportunities for children to hear and use the words. Use questions strategically to prompt children to respond using words they have learned and add additional words into conversations when appropriate. Next slide. So a great way to prompt our children into using the words that we're focusing on is also to incorporate those vocabulary words in all the days or transitions that children have. This happens to be an example of being outside on the playground and the children working together to talk about bridges and what kinds of pieces you would need for the bridge, what kind of tools you might want to have around. So we talked about hammers and we talked about drills and we could pretend to have those tools with us. We had some plastic ones that helped too, but it was a great way to incorporate those conversations and a meaningful play structure that the children were already engaging in. And we as teachers could model those words and also reinforce um, positive guidance when children use them in the correct context. Next slide. Hello, everyone. I'm Jill Kanamati, and I'm going to talk through recommendation six, which is to build children's knowledge of letters and sounds. So children's early knowledge of letters and sounds will help them learn how to read words and may contribute to their development of other literacy skills like spelling. Specifically, exploring and identifying the sounds of language is important for developing literacy. Awareness of the sounds of language, also referred to as phonological awareness, is essential for helping children to begin to understand that words are made up of sounds and that when blended, these sounds make words. Additionally important for literacy development is the knowledge of letter names and sounds. Preschool teachers can help children begin to understand the often complex relationship between sounds and letters and they can help teacher children listen for sounds and connect them to letters they see. With practice and repetition, children will be able to recognize many letters and identify some of the sounds those letters make. Next slide. So this recommendation, Build Children's Knowledge of Letters and Sounds, provides four steps for building children's early understanding of letters and sounds they make. The first step helps children understand that words are made up of different sounds. The next two steps introduce the letters and their sounds and intentionally plan time for children to practice their letter knowledge. The final step involves finding ways for children and teachers to discuss letters and sounds in words throughout the day. Next slide. So our first how-to step is initially focusing on listening for sounds in words. So children will need an introduction to the idea that words are made up of different sounds. The awareness of the smaller sounds in words can set the stage for learning that letters have different sounds and that blending the sound those letters make is reading. So a great example of doing this is to point out words that are made up of sounds like ba and ike and bike and ba and all and ball and getting children to really listen for that beginning sound ba. And you can do this throughout the day and have children try to hear other words that start with that ba sound. At lunch, they might point out banana, for example. You can tell children to listen for words that share the same beginning or end sound in a song or a book or a poem with alliteration. And when we say alliteration, we mean that there are the same sounds or at the beginning of adjacent words. So a great example of a book with alliteration is a book called Silly Sally. Tons of alliteration with that S sound, Silly Sally. Children can pay attention to that beginning of sound, that S sound. You can also do this with words that rhyme. For example, you can have children clap when they hear words that went, end with that at sound as well. Next slide. So our next how-to step is 
to intentionally introduce a new letter in its sound. And you've heard that word intentional a lot today. And that's really the key here. So think about how you're gonna introduce a letter and how you're gonna introduce a letter. So some of these tips can help with that. So in thinking about where you're gonna start, start with letter and sounds that children are familiar with and add on letters and sounds from there. So I often say that children are often most familiar with the letters in their name. That first letter in their name, they often feel a little bit of ownership over. So that's a great place to start, something where they're familiar and then move to more unfamiliar letters from there. And then in explaining that, you're gonna be intentional and clearly explain the letter name, and then the sound that that letter makes. A great way to do this, to get children attending to the shape of that letter, is to show them how to write that target letter. And for an added bonus, you can get some mathematical language in there. You can say things like for the A, you're gonna draw a diagonal line, you're gonna dialogue, draw a line across. Those words like diagonal and across are great for mathematics development. And then the very confusing part of our language is many letters have different sounds, right? And so you're gonna to wanna to be very clear about that. For letters that have more than one sound, explain that those letters make more than one sound and then tell the children those sounds very clearly. For A, you can say sometimes A says its name and sometimes A makes the accent. Next slide. So for our th third how-to step, you're gonna to wanna to use materials and activities that allow children to practice this letter identification and their corresponding sounds. What we know is that children need multiple and re repeated exposures to letters and sounds they make, which is not surprising. There are a lot of letters, there's a lot of different sounds. So they're gonna need repeated practice. So what you'll wanna do is choose activities and materials that can be used in times like small group or whole group or centers to provide them with opportunities to productive practice, identifying that letter name, discuss that letter and its sound. You're gonna to wanna to be sure to include those previously learned letters for children to review and continue to practice as well. Doing this can be so much fun. Games are a great way to review letters, things like alphabet puzzles. There's all sorts of creative materials that you can start using to get that practice in. Next slide. So this really gets us into how to step four, which is to include print throughout the classroom to provide additional opportunities to discuss their letters and their sounds. So making print a regular part of the classroom is not only gonna help children familiarize themselves with letters, but it will also provide multiple, multiple opportunities for teachers to discuss the letters and the sounds they make. What a great way to do this is using labels throughout the classroom. When I was, I was a teacher, I learned that putting up labels could be so useful, but I also learned it was really helpful to get children involved in the making of those labels. So if I had a child in my classroom named Maria, I would think about that first sound in her name, that letter M with the M, and she would help us write the label for Mir. She'd write the M, the rest of the class would help the rest of the word. As a group, we'd put that up. And then children are really, really attached to what those labels were and truly understood it. And they were surrounded by print in the classroom. You can also use children's names throughout the classroom. Things like sign-up cards. When they get in the classroom, they find their name and they move it to the pile that says they're here. So just using that in daily routines. Also, teachers often talk about the daily schedule at the beginning of the day. Write that out and point out the letters you've been talking about in that daily schedule. You can bring materials into dramatic play. We've already seen a great example of this, but if you have a restaurant, for example, in your dramatic play, have a menu with all sorts of great print. You can talk about the pea and pizza on your menu, for example. And then set up a reading library or a quiet space for children to explore print independently. If you've done a shared book reading and you've talked about print, the book has some really great print, you've pointed out letters in that book, if you have that in that reading space for children to look through independently, they can practice pointing out those letters. Next slide. So here's another example of ways that we can help children engage in writing, thinking about their names. So this happens to be a garden plot that we have outside on our playground space. And each child was responsible for labeling the plant that they planted themselves, weeded and watered, and so they got to watch it grow, but also being able to include their name beside the plant. So they had to write their names on their <clears throat> identification sticks in order to remember which plant was theirs. It also helped us as teachers to remember whose was where and who did what. But another meaningful way, because we can encourage children to come over and write their names, because if you don't write your, your name, how are we going to know where your spot is? So again, using ways to incorporate writing, letter knowledge in meaningful ways in the classroom setting. Next slide. 
Great, I'm gonna introduce recommendation seven now. So this is to use shared book reading to develop children's language, knowledge of print features, and knowledge of the world. So shared book reading involves the teacher reading a book and encouraging children to be actively engaged in responding to the book as it's read. These interactions are really key, and these interactions can be used to build knowledge about the social and natural world, to teach many components of literacy, such as vocabulary, print features, including letters, and phonological awareness. The panel recommends reading books to children multiple times a day using either the same book or different books. You really want to do this at least one reading a day. Next slide. So this recommendation really focuses on how to use shared book reading time to teach early literacy concepts effectively. The first two of our steps detail how to prepare for the reading. The last three steps provide more guidance on how to carry out the reading with young children. Next slide. So the first of our how to two steps is to select a variety of informational and narrative books that are appropriate for three, four, and five-year-olds. I like to think of this recommendation as planning for a balanced diet of books in your classroom. You really wanna have a variety. So first part of that and thinking about that balance is to choose books that touch on topics of interest to children or that relate to something that they may have experienced so they can connect with that. You can do books that are about making friends with a new child to just move down the block or playing make-believe, for example. Next slide. Another piece to put in sort of thinking about this variety and having a good balanced diet of books is to really ensure that children regularly see people like themselves in the books that are read, as well as people from other cultures. You also might want to think about choosing books that align with the focus of the literacy lesson for that day of week or week, such as books with print features that include words or the target letter, or books that have interesting or large print. Those are so great to point out those words and those letters and the books that children are reading and learning. And again, if you put that in a reading center, they can look through those books and point that out themselves. Next slide. So the final point I want to make about this is um, when you're thinking about a variety of books, it's important to have both informational and narrative books. So when we think about informational books, those are nonfiction or expository books that inform the reader about a topic and include accurate facts. And then narrative books are written accounts of connected events, often a story. So I would say that we should have this both informational and narrative because they both have really unique benefits for children. So informational books often have very cool technical vocabulary in. In them, they have informational text features that are different than narrative, labels and table of contents and indexes. What's great about getting, getting kids familiar with these text features is that they're gonna see them later when they're reading textbooks in third and fourth and fifth grade, and they won't be novel or new to them. They'll have already known about them from being read informational books. They also have cause and effect language, which is great for children to learn, and they can be on really interesting topics for children. Narrative books themselves have some unique benefits. They have a story structure, a beginning, middle, and end. Those can be abstract concepts for children, but putting that within the context of the story can be really helpful. And narrative books themselves have some really interesting vocabulary for children as well. Next slide. How to step number two. Prior to the lesson, plan the purpose for the reading book and determine when to discuss certain topics and words with children. Plan a different focus for each time you read the book. Review the book ahead of time to determine when to pause to discuss vocabulary, print features like font changes, speech bubbles, or letters, or questions or prompts related to the content of the book. Prior to reading the book, it might be a good opportunity to identify some of these words that children don't typically learn independently to teach some of these vocabulary words. This is a perfect opportunity also to focus on concept knowledge by choosing books, perhaps narrative and fiction book pair that are on a theme like where animals live. Next slide. Write what to point out or what to ask on sticky notes and place them on the book to help you identify the word or a particular concept you wanna point out to children. Ensure that stopping points during the readings are spread out enough so as not to interfere with the children's understanding of the book. Next slide, please. So this is an example from our classroom where together we read The Little Mouse, The Red Ripe Strawberry, and The Big Hungry Bear. The first time we read the book to get the story idea together, we talked about what happened with The Big Hungry Bear and the strawberry. The second time we read it again, but this time we had a focus about thinking about how could we safely take care of that strawberry from that big hungry bear. 
So then after we read it for a third time, again, thinking about what we were gonna do to protect the strawberry, focusing on some focus words within the vocabulary that we were reading, and then reading the book a fourth time. To think about what happened in the book, reflecting back on the things that we did. Throughout these reading times, we also had opportunities for everybody to try to create ways to save their strawberry. As you can see in the photo, some people decided that they would make a box or a cube. So again, taking language from math and incorporating it with a language activity. Some decided that they would put it in a Ziploc baggie. We learned very quickly that strawberries don't last in Ziploc baggies. But we had lots of different ideas, drawing strawberries, making sure that we could um, create a treasure. Some of them thought that they could draw a strawberry that would distract the bear and not eat their strawberry. So some examples of ways that you can incorporate reading books multiple times, but being able to focus on different aspects as you read them. Next slide. Great, so how to step three is preparing children for listening to and discussing the content of the book before the reading the book aloud. So these next few points are all about sort of activating prior knowledge. When children know something about the topic of the book, they can really connect the information to the book to something they know, or they've heard about, or their experience, you're getting that background knowledge activated. So you might wanna start by asking children about what they already know about the topic of the book. You can then discuss the connections between the book and what they know, and then you can invite them to share their thoughts on the topic before you begin reading, get them really talking back and forth about it. Next slide. So this point is about, you know, if you think that the children in your classroom may not know much what the book is going to be about, here's going to where you want to build knowledge before you read. So present information that might help familiarize them with the topic, engage them in those multi-turn conversations we talked about to prepare them to better understand what the book is about, the vocabulary and some of the knowledge that they might need to know to really help understand and with comprehension that book. Next slide. How to step number four, engage in conversations with children while reading the book. Consider, re cons consider asking questions before, during, and after reading the book. While reading the book, stop periodically at the stopping points determined in step two, where you have the sticky notes to encourage children to discuss a word, a letter, or an interesting picture. Ask questions that encourage multi-word answers and multi-turn conversations. These questions typically are the inferential type. What do you think is gonna happen next? What do you think he was doing? Ask children to justify their answers. And when children have a question about the book, walk them through the, look, walk them through the book by looking back in the book to find the answer. Next slide, please. If children can answer simpler questions, begin asking increasingly complex questions. Teachers can ask children questions that encourage children to use vocabulary or words, or make connections about what happened in the book, or what happened to a character in the book, or what that character is going to do next. This might include questions that ask why a character did something, what the character might be feeling, what might happen next, or what experiences the children have that are similar. So depending on the developmental level of the children, you might consider asking literal questions, what is this, or more complex questions, such as inferential questions. Next slide. So we've been talking about questions, and this continues to build off the story that we read earlier in the classroom, the little mouse, the red ripe strawberry, and the big hungry bear. So the children together created questions that they had to problem solve. We decided that it would be interesting to see if we could build a box to save our strawberry and maybe that would fool that great big bear from finding the strawberry and eating it. When we thought about those questions, we wrote them down together as a class. So you can see on the corner of the table there are questions. So as we talked together in small groups, we were working on our project, using our hammers and things of that nature, we could go back to our questions and ponder them in discussions together. It was a neat opportunity to keep that story meaningful and engaging. And a lot of times the children retold the story to one another as they were sitting there talking about the pieces that they were putting together. Food for thought, don't let children hammer on the table because the nails go right through them. But we learned and we had a really good time. Next slide. 
Great. And that example is such a great segue into our final house step, two step, which is to really align literacy activities with the focus of the shared book reading. I like to think of this as getting mileage of that, about that really great shared book reading that you've just done. So interactive small group activities like we just heard about, provide children opportunities to, to use or rehearse what they've learned from the book. So thinking about when fo the focus is discussing the content of the book, that beginning, middle, and end, you might want to set up activities related to understanding the story presented in the book and the order in which it's done. So you consider using puppets or figurines or role playing to act out that story. Next slide. Okay, thank you, Peg, Jorge, Jill, and Elizabeth. We will now move on to the question and answer portion. Thank you to all our attendees for submitting your questions in the Q&A box. I invite the presenters to turn on the video screens for this Q&A portion. Thank you. Our first question I'm going to post to the group, so feel free to chime in. What are some ways to encourage families to read to their children at home and use these recommendations to help their children? Who'd like to answer that one? So I'll start with activities that we do in terms of engaging with families at home for reading. We have a library program within our own classrooms where let books from school can go home for the night or go home for the week. And so they can essentially check them out. And again, it's ways to help encourage families to read books, especially if there seems to be a really favorite book in the classroom that a child wants to take home read over and over again and share with their parents and their family members. And so making it available, they all have um, basically a backpack that the book slides into. We rotate those books. Sometimes we rotate them based on new things that we get ourselves, or sometimes the children will rotate them because they have a special book that they were reading and that they want to take home. The other one is that we do a meet and greet night um, with our families. And during that time, we also include information from our local libraries. Sometimes parents just, you know, you're really busy and it's really hard to get over to the local library to set up a library card. Now it's really nice because you can do them mostly online and then go into your library and just show your identification and they will give you a library card right then and there and you can check out as many books as you want. And so making it accessible to parents sometimes is the way to help encourage them to read is to help with those little incremental steps to make it more successful that they can get books and things of that nature. So those are some ways that we specifically work with our families to encourage them to read at home with their children. Okay, thank you. I'll move on to our next question. I'll pose this question for Jill. The students in my class pronounce the, le the sounds letters make differently. How should I be teaching letters? Should I be teaching them the sounds they make in each dialect or the way we pronounce them in school? Jill? This is such a great question because I think it's really important to think about dialects. So dialects are forms of language that are unique to a specific region or group of people. So in some dialects, for example, the N sounds in words are often dropped. So children who speak with one of these dialects will need more exposure to those N sounds to learn them. So for these children, it might be really important to think about to begin this phonological awareness or paying attention to those sounds of language, that instruction, by focusing them on those sounds at the beginning and the middle of the word so they can practice that skill and be, then become comfortable with it. And then you can talk about, oh, you know, there's this end sound of the word, let's listen for it and have that conversation. But it's such an important thing to be thinking about as you're thinking about sequence of instruction and where children are comfortable and what they're, they've been hearing, especially when you're thinking about phonological awareness. So good, good thing to be thinking about. Thanks, Jill. Our next question I will pose to Jorge. When asking children what they know about the topic, sometimes they share incorrect information. How should I correct them? Jorge? Also, I mean, that really is a great question as well. You know, children bring a wealth of knowledge, background knowledge to the setting they're in, and especially shared book reading. You know, when, uh, we, when that came up in one of our um, shared reading interventions, we, um, we coach the teacher to, to acknowledge what the child said and find however tenuous the relationship is to the topic that's being discussed. If you think really hard, everything is related at that age during shared book reading. So I might say, 
you know, that's a great answer. Uh, maybe this is the way it's related, but I never would say, oh, that, that's not right. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, given the population age group that we're talking about, I would just find a connection, however tenuous, and then perhaps do a little scaffolding with, well, that could be this, but it also could be this. I'll just add that I completely agree with that, Jorge. And I think the beauty of shared book reading is that interaction piece. We know that's what makes it so meaningful. So what Jorge was talking about gives a great example of a multi-turn conversation where you're having a great discussion and a really rich discussion that the child is brought up and is engaged in and sort of started. So um, I think that back and forth plays out so nicely. And you can see that as a big benefit of shared book reading is those multi-turn conversations and practice with language. Agreed, Jill. Mm -hmm. I would just pick back on that. But sometimes saying to a child, you know, hmm, I wonder, let's go back and look at it. So you're not necessarily saying, oh, this is wrong or that wasn't quite the correct information, but kind of taking it on yourself as a, huh, I have to think about that. Let me, let's go back and look together and rereading it together. So again, that you can incorporate that opportunity to learn. Because I mean, how many times have we sort of misremembered something? or we tell something that we thought was a certain way and it wasn't quite that way. So we don't wanna feel embarrassed that we didn't remember it quite the way it went. And so that way of doing it together is another way that you can also help support when that information isn't correct. Yeah, I love that point. And so I've done with children, I've even pointed out, you know, good readers really think about what they read. And if they miss something, they go back. Because we know that's a really great strategy for reading comprehension is to monitor what you've been reading. So I love that idea. And even pointing out, oh, you know what? You're being a great reader. And we've got to look back and see what's happened a couple of pages before. That's a great strategy to model for, for children as well. And it may be a good opportunity if, if, it, if, the, informa if the, the information the child shared was on a vocabulary word to revisit the vocabulary word, perhaps give a different definition of it. Excellent, thank you. I'll move on to the next question and I'll pose this one to the whole group. Is there value to storytelling without a print book? Who'd like to answer that one? Well, I can give it a start. I'm sure Elizabeth and Jorge both have great ideas about this too. And I say, absolutely. Uh, again, it's about practicing language and language development, telling a story without print. Gosh, you can talk about really interesting vocabulary, have those multi-turn conversations about the story. And like I talked about, this concept of beginning, middle, and end can be very abstract for children. So telling a story and having to think back about what happened first and then next and those sequence of things can be incredibly helpful for language development. So I would say absolutely. I would say the same. Um, many of the books that um, parents use don't have print. And this is a rich opportunity to ask inferential level questions. What do you think the bear was thinking when it saw its shadow? Um, or any other question. Um, it is a good opportunity to engage in interactive conversations with children and just build a world around the storybook. I would echo all of those things because, you know, I remember as a child, my grandfather telling stories about when he grew up and his adventures on the farm. And I can just think back to, I didn't need pictures to look at or the words in a book to make those images in my mind. And those are stories that we retell every year, Christmas or holidays and things of that nature. And so there's also a cultural aspect to retelling stories that provide history and culture and the reasons why things are done the way that we do them in our families or in our classrooms. And so they're absolutely valuable to incorporate as well. And I'll just piggyback on top of that. I think that you know different ways of storytelling is a wonderful way of valuing children's background because there are, there are differences in different communities about how stories are told and what stories are told. And it gives you an opportunity to really help children feel valued in the classroom. Thank you all. Our next question is for Peg. These recommendations focus a lot on teaching, but my children are between three and five years old. They can't pay attention for that long. What should I do? Peg? Wonderful question. And I think, you know, especially today when we oftentimes have these 
mixed stage classrooms where teachers have children anywhere from, you know, just barely three to almost six. And so it's a real challenge to try to figure out how you keep children engaged who are developmentally so different. And I, you know, I think that there are several things that I would recommend and then I really would love to hear from my other panelists. Um, so I think one is, you know, this is one of the reasons why it's really important to use whole group instruction for a very limited amount of time. That if you've got children whose who's attention, you know, it's, it's probably too much to expect really young children to pay attention, to sit quietly and pay attention for very long. And so 10 minutes might be about the maximum. And then I think that to the extent that you can organize activities and organize it in a way where you have one set of activities, say small group or center activities for children who, whose skills are at a certain level and another set for children whose skills are at a different level that you'll, you'll, you'll be able to engage, and especially if those are engaging activities, you'll, the children will really enjoy this and stay engaged. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. I agree, Peg. And it, I think it's nice to think about whole group act activities. I think the 10 minutes is a good amount of time. And thinking about it as introducing activities that are then in small group that they're really engaging in and really can be entertained by. So, you know, when I was giving some examples of letters, like that whole group activity is when you're explaining where the alphabet puzzle is and how it works, or you're explaining the magnet letters and what's where what center it's in and how you can play with it, or where the books in the center are so they can understand sort of what it is you're introducing and what is this new activity and how they can then engage in it in a small group activity to really keep them engaged and doing more of that hands-on. Yeah, I would agree with Jill and Peg. One thing that uh, you might consider doing is uh, getting them actively engaged. So uh, saying, turn around and tell your partner. So that gets them actively engaged with each other around something you're teaching. And um, uh, uh, that could be a very useful way to keep them attending. I'd piggyback on all of those. One of the things we talk a lot about is that intentional planning and that when you've got a group of children who maybe have a wide range of attention spans, really thinking about those plans that you're putting into action before you even get started. Reading the book ahead of time, making sure that the book is interesting. Because there are some times when we get a book and I'm like, oh no, this is not going to last anyone because I can barely keep my eyes on it. And so planning it and being intentional before you even start your small group or whole group. The other thing is read the room. There are just some days where children as a whole group are really engaged with that book and you could read the entire thing without any disruption. And then there's days when, I don't know, it's raining, the moon is out and they're just having a hard time focusing. And so stop, don't feel like you have to push through to the end of the book or to a certain point because you've planned it, adjust according to what you're seeing with the children. Cause you can always come back to it at a later point we use a bookmark in our books when we have those moments or we read at times chapter books right before they're getting ready to go for nap time to help wind everybody down. And so we'll read books and then put a bookmark in it. And so we do talk about like we didn't get a chance to read this entire book, but I saved my bookmark. And we also use it at the end of the day because sometimes we'll read books before it's time for parents to come pick up and we'll have a child who's really, really engaged with that book and a parent who's really, really ready to go home. So we'll use our bookmark to hold our spot and remind that child that we'll come back to it and read it again the next time. So just thinking about how we're intentional when we're responding to children, don't feel like you have to, have to, have to finish that 10 minute time or that entire book in order to keep everyone's attention. So read, read what your children are showing you. I love that point about the book. And I often say that because I just talked about the benefits of informational and narrative books. Sometimes informational books are long. There's a lot of information in them. And so sitting down and reading that entire book is a daunting task. So that's Elizabeth's point, a great one. Take a look at that information book. And that's a great way to point out features like the table of contents. Say to kids, 
come on up and let's look at the table of contents. Which of the three pieces of information are we going to learn about? And just read those pages of the information book. That really engages children, teaches them about the features, and keeps it at a really manageable length. Because sometimes informational books can be can be a little too long, but they're really great for that. So I think gauging that is important as well. That made me think of being engaged. And so there's a difference between reading a book very monotone versus having animation when you read it and how you hold the book. Those are pieces too that I always think are little just tips when I watch teachers read and kind of like, hmm, yeah, I'd be falling asleep too. Because if you're not interested in what you're reading or thinking about, um, you know, the voices that could possibly change and something that might be a little slower to read or a little faster to read, um, those two can help keep children engaged in that time when you're engaged with the reading of the book too. Excellent conversation. I love the back and forth on these questions. Our next question I will pose for Elizabeth. I have a very limited library of books in my classroom. How do I include books about topics children are interested in or have experienced without spending all my money? Elizabeth? Sure, great question. So when I think about libraries in our classroom settings, there's a couple of things that we do. So the first, again, is that library book card. Um, being able to go to your local library. So ours here in Indiana allow you to check out 100 books at a time. And they also have a very um, helpful relationship with teachers. And so we literally can call the library and say, we're doing a theme on dinosaurs. And so could you pull a bunch of dinosaur books for us? And those are helpful because, you know, teachers, we've got a lot of time on our hands, don't we? But it's helpful because they'll pull things for us and that we can check them out, have them in the classroom, and then be able to take them back when we're done. They also do extended library loans for classroom teachers. So normally you get a library book for about two weeks or so, but classroom teachers, you usually can get it for a little bit longer. So I encourage you to check out your local library and talk to them about being a classroom teacher and how library books are really useful. The other thing that we use to build our classroom libraries is scholastic book orders. And again, it's nothing that is too cumbersome. Um, they come you can join online, you can send opportunities for parents to purchase books online, or they have little flyers that go home once a month. And so anytime someone purchases a book, the classroom teacher earns points. And so with those points, you can purchase books for your classroom library. And so that's really nice too. The last thing that we've done is actually a book swap. And so we did a book donation and we literally just sent emails out, flyers out to our families in our community, families that had graduated from our program as well, and just said, we're doing a book collection. And so I was really surprised at how many books got donated. And it was really nice to just get started with some books and themes. Yes, you need to go through them because some of the books may not be developmentally appropriate for your classroom setting. Um, and some books may be topics that you're not exactly sure you want in your rooms, but it was really nice to see that the parents participated. And then we could also share those books with everybody in the community. I hope that helps to think of some ideas and how to build your classroom library. Thanks, Elizabeth. Our next question is for Jill. Can you talk about how to encourage children to use books to answer questions they have? Jill? Sure, and I think I'm gonna go back to my information book to keep talking about that, but I think, and Jorge sort of mentioned this in an answer question, Elizabeth too, when you're thinking about, gosh, I don't know the answer to the question, or they've said something that's not quite right, um, saying and modeling, gosh, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question either. Let's go to a book. And this gives them this idea of the concept of reading, that print and that books, give us information. It's such a key idea. And this is a great way to get kids talking back and forth about this and having them point out that print is going to give them information. So um, when you get a question like that, that takes it as a wonderful teachable moment. Thanks, Jill. Our next question I'll post to the group. What letters should I start with? I, I can start with that one again and love, love to hear my other panelists thought, but sort of like I mentioned um, as we were going through the slides, 
I often find that children understand letters and think about and connect to letters first with their own name. I was thinking about that. I was talking, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a necklace that has a J on it. <laughs> so it's something that I think throughout life, you know, you, you associate yourself with the letters in your name, but particularly that first letter. So as a classroom teacher, we talked a lot about that because it was an easy way to get this concept of these little symbols have names attached to them and sounds. Um, so using those letters in the classroom and those names in the classroom can be really helpful. I had kids in my classroom say things like, there's Maria's M or Edward's E because they got so used to seeing things like that. Another thing that's, you know, moving from letters that our children are comfortable with to some of those new ones, shapes that children often see often get them thinking about that letter name. So they see X's and O's often in regard to shapes. So those are letter names that they often attach to early. And then you might want to go towards the ends of talking about letters to those letters that children aren't going to see very frequently or you're not seeing very frequently in the English language like Q. By that time, you've talked about letters so much and they're so comfortable with them, you can say things like Q is often followed by its friend U, and you can talk about how Q and U often go together. So you can see how there's a little bit of a sequence between what children are really comfortable with, get them this idea that letters are abstract and they have names and sounds, and then you can get a little bit more complicated as you go. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Jill. Um, I would add playing letter games as well. Uh, the idea of, okay, this is the letter, you know, J for Jorge and Jill. And um, uh, what else in the room starts with J? And then they go for a little hunt in the room, the classroom, looking. Uh, maybe you strategically post things on the letters you're going to cover that day uh, that children can find in the room. I agree. I think letters can be so much fun when you think creatively about it. Print in the room, part of dramatic play. The example that Elizabeth showed with the tools and the words attached to them, what a great way to start talking about letters. Games and puzzles, um, there's just a lot of ways you can make letters and hunting for letters a really fun activity and a, just a great way to practice doing it very naturally throughout the day. Thank you all. I think uh, that's all the time we have for questions. We got through a decent amount and that was great conversation. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I'm going to move on now. And on the next slide, I'll explain where additional questions could be submitted if we didn't get to your question. I want to take this time now to thank our panelists, Peg, Jorge, Jill, and Elizabeth for their presentations on recommendations five, six, and seven, and their insightful responses to questions. This was the last of three webinars for this practice guide on preparing young children for school. The first webinar was on Tuesday and focused on the first and second practice guide recommendations on social emotional learning and executive function. The second webinar was yesterday and focused on recommendations three and four on mathematical ideas and mathematical language. This presentation contains just a few examples from the practice guide. The full practice guide and additional materials can be accessed on the What Works Clearinghouse website. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, this webinar was recorded. A link to view the recorded webinar will be shared via email to all attendees who registered for this webinar. The recording will also be available on the IES website. If you have additional questions, please submit them via email to the WWC Help Desk at contact dot wwc at ed dot gov. Thank you. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>